Uh, certainly, uh, the conversation uh, on the sidelines is, is, is one of the reasons we're here, and it's very valuable. But uh, if we could uh, attempt to wind those down, we'll, we'll get going with our next panel. We're, we're already running a bit behind. Um, thanks very much. So I'm, uh, I'm Joe Mann. I'm, um, I think my, my official title is Richard Sidekick. I'm also in the, um, the San Francisco Bureau of the Financial Times. Um, I specialize in the PC industry and um, also cover cybersecurity, privacy, things like that. But I've been in the Valley for, um, uh, since uh, 99, 98, and uh, uh, excited to carry on the conversation. I want to say at the, we've got a terrific panel here. Um, and if there's anything that particularly offended you in the previous panel, feel free to go back and, and correct the error of their ways now that they can't uh, come back to you. Um, so uh, we have here, uh, um, uh, from my left, we have uh, Howard Hartenbaum, a uh, partner with August Capital, who's had a, a string of consumer uh, home runs, uh, starting with uh, Skype, or I wouldn't say starting with Skype, but perhaps most dramatically Skype, uh, but also uh, Bebo and Photobucket, just to name a few. So a really exceptional record there. Um, and w w one of the things I like about this panel is they're very different perspectives. Um, Howard's at August Capital, traditional um, top tier venture firm, whereas uh, it was Bill, um, uh, Bill Maris, uh, next, uh, next to him, uh, to your right, my left, is at Google Ventures. Uh, so a corporate VC, but not in the sense of uh, strategic uh, investments uh, as Intel and, uh, and others. Uh, they're looking uh, for value and, and, and hits on the merits rather than uh, something that aligns with uh, Google's worldview and strategy. Um, uh, uh, apparently in his spare time, according to the, the background bio sheet I have, he's a brain, uh, brain surgeon, uh, which uh, that's probably an exaggeration, but he, he does have, do you have an MD and a PhD? Or? I have a degree in neuroscience, but uh, you do not want me practicing surgery. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, fairly impressive background uh, there. Uh, and next to him, we have uh, Aiden Senkut of, uh, uh, is it Felicis? How do you pronounce it? Felicis, Felicis. Uh, uh, Ventures. Um, uh, up and coming, uh, was named one of the top uh, 25 tech angels by Business Week. So he has a bit of an, an angel background as well as venture. Um, uh, portfolio includes uh, Justin.tv, uh, uh, some of you have probably heard of. Uh, Rovio um, might have, uh, is occupying most of my kids' time. I don't know about uh, your kids. Um, and other uh, takeouts from the likes of Google, Twitter, Groupon, Microsoft, Disney, eBay, and fair other, a, fair, a fair number of other fairly decent uh, exits there. Some are still uh, ongoing. And, uh, and last, on my left, we have Ian uh, Sobieski, uh, Managing Director of the Band of Angels. Uh, uh, fabulous uh, Valley story. Um, uh, uh, more than uh, 40 uh, successful exits uh, out of 240 investments, uh, and really kind of the, uh, the lifeblood in the, in, in, the, in the Valley, I think, uh, from an angel perspective. I think I'd actually like to start with you because one of the shifts we've seen um, in the past few years as venture returns and venture uh, exits have, have diminished, I think has been uh, the rise of angel investing in importance um, rel relative. And I'm wondering, among other things, if that has, if you've sort of, a, in a political campaign, everybody sort of plays towards the, uh, towards the center uh, during, um, during the main election, uh, even if, if they've tacked to the right or the left in the primary, have you, are angels tacking uh, more towards later stage uh, now because they can? Are they, uh, are they changing the terms that they're seeking uh, from the entrepreneurs? Uh, well, I can't speak for all angels everywhere. I can only provide the one perspective I have from having been doing pretty much the same thing at the Band of Angels for 14 years and seeing the landscape shift around me when I got started with the Band of Angels. Angels were, um, it may be hard to remember, but still uh, stuck with kind of a label of amateurs. And there's uh, the, the conventional wisdom was that you want to be careful about whether you want angels in your deal at all, because the VCs are the professionals. And sometimes even just having an angel in your deal can be a stigma that might prevent you from getting funded. And it's amazing how in just a decade, that's pretty much that kind of stigma doesn't exist anymore. And what 
what you really see are angels still play across the range, right? I mean, I have an E-Trade account and invest in public stocks, but that doesn't make me a hedge fund manager. It just means that as an individual, I do a lot of different kinds of investing. But what I think you've really found in the last couple of years, really, is that there's a recognition that the financial uh, food chain is evolving, as it has throughout, the American, throughout American history. And angels have very particular competitive advantages that make them a legitimate and sort of consistent, stable piece of that food chain that work in a very kind of predictable way and a way that's increasingly well understood, and all the nuances of it are well understood by entrepreneur and small VC and larger VC alike. So I actually just think that um, whereas angels are always going to do different things, um, the, uh, the food chain is becoming better understood by everybody. Maybe I can expand on that. So um, if you add everything that I've done as an angel and as an you know, institutional seed fund, it's been about five and a half years since I've been active. And that might not seem like a lot of time, but I'll give you a couple anecdotal evidences. When I first started, uh, there was probably five to ten prominent angels in the whole angel community, I would say, in terms of like the people where the name is well known, I would say maybe around 50, maybe 100. Um, today there's probably thousands, uh, if not hundreds. Um, and things have changed so much, so we're only touching angel investing, but when I started, all these people invested out of their own pocket, including myself. This summer, there was another event, every single person had a seed fund. Even Mike Larrington has a seed fund. Um, when I started, there might have been other incubators, but I think Y Combinator was the first to make a really big name for incubators. Now there are tons of incubators. In fact, I just heard I'm going to LA tonight for another event, and there are four incubators in LA now. Um, so things are changing really fast. When, when, when I started angel investing, there was no angel list. Now you have angel list, Kickstarter, bunch of other things where people can actually get matched online to other investors and people that can help them. Um, some of the VCs that are today that are making a great name like Google Ventures, Andreessen Horowitz, didn't even exist a few years ago. And now when you look at the speed that they're investing or their differentiation, they're really shaking up the industry. So I think, uh, I would say that things are happening. Things are happening really fast. And it is becoming more and more important in this sea of change, number one, as things change faster, to really have a concrete value message. And I think what we're seeing is that the founders uh, are doing a lot more homework. And there are a lot more startups there. And they're really going around and checking um, investors' background. And it becomes so much more important what the investors stand for, their operational background, and what they can generally help. Uh, the founders with it, not just capital, and I feel capital is increasingly a commodity these days. Bill, if we could just sort of broaden this out um, and, and talk about your general views of the, the, the state of the universe uh, in the, at least the valley part of the universe. The, the, if you can touch on some of those themes, the, the sort of the, the shift in stage of investing or the balance of power between entrepreneurs and, and investment community, I'd, I'd be interested in that as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. I, when you say balance of power, it, it does imply that we're on one side and entrepreneurs are on, on another side. And uh, having founded companies, and most of the folks on our team have founded companies, we sort of look at the venture business a little bit differently and uh, uh, think of ourselves as trying to find entrepreneurs that we can sit down at a table with and invest with. Because ultimately, the, the dance you do before you invest is a much shorter time period than everything that happens after the investment uh, closes. So uh, Iden had mentioned sort of some of the things we're trying to do to to shake up the venture industry. It's not directed at that, but we uh, don't collect a fee on our, uh, we don't have a management fee structure. So we have a very uh, relatively large team uh, uh, of, uh, of folks who are employed to, um, from product developers, uh, UX designers, technical recruiters, and uh, engineering recruiters, uh, whose purpose and direction is to help our companies that we've invested in grow. Um, so. Uh, rather than, uh, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a selfless sort of thing in the sense that we're not collecting a management fee, so we can use the capital that we would otherwise be sort of paying ourselves as we collect more and more, uh, as we set up additional funds. It's, it's based on our belief that helping companies with some of these key challenges, uh, recruiting engineers and uh, helping with um, some of the problems we faced in building companies will ultimately uh, create bigger enterprises down the road. And uh, just because everybody else has had a crack, what's your what's your opening statement on the uh, on the, the situation in the valley? 
so, you know, I, I've been an angel, a micro cap VC or super angel, along with Bill Draper, and now I'm a VC at August Capital. And those are three different types of investing. And I've been an entrepreneur. And my, my general view is that there's some entrepreneurs who are looking for um, angels. And there's some entrepreneurs who are looking for micro cap VCs. And there's some entrepreneurs who are looking for VCs. And I don't really find them being all that competitive uh, with each other. The entrepreneurs that want a venture firm that's going to uh, stick around through thick and thin in the long term and have reserves for the investment and more fiduciary responsibility to the company, oversight, um, and that type of stuff, is one type of entrepreneur. There's those who want you know, no assistance or participation from their investors. There's those that want great um, microcap VCs like Iden, for example, who are very participatory and help out the company. And, and I think it's, it's not as simple as you know, one is displacing the other. I think it's, there's just more options and the right type of entrepreneur has to hook up with the right type of investment for that entrepreneur. And if that's not clearly understood or defined in the process, then post-financing you, you have a mismatch and you have issues that are going on. So, you know, we always have a very you know, open discussions with the entrepreneurs. What are you looking for? What are your plans for the company? Are you planning to sell the company soon? How fast do you want to grow? What are you going to do if things are tough? And then we determine if it's a good fit for us and a good fit for them. But we don't really find ourselves competing with microcap VCs or, um, or angels. In fact, I, I think the size of the angel slash microcap VC financing has gotten so large that we're having entrepreneurs come to us now and say, well, we can get you know, a million and a half from those guys, but will you give us a million and a half? And we're like, yeah, we'll do that. And then we just do the whole thing ourselves, and it's simpler and more straightforward. Are, are you having to, um, just to follow up with you, are you having to uh, have more flexibility in your investment model than in the past, open to be a wider range of, of sizes and stages? Um, it, it, it seems to me that uh, given the overall industry returns, and I guess we still have a shakeout in, in process, it, it, it would be a lot easier to play it the traditional angel way and just make lots of tiny bets and, and figure that something will hit big. Uh, so no, at, at, uh, you know, I can't speak on behalf of other firms, but at August Capital, we've remained extremely traditional. We make early investments into companies, usually the first professional money in, um, the smallest size financing that we've done is a million dollar range and the largest uh, in our early stage fund is a $25 million range. So anything kind of in there, most of the investments we make look more traditional like four, five, six, seven million dollar type of investment. And in, in several cases, it's two entrepreneurs with an idea and they haven't proven anything other than they have you know, good background and interesting technology concepts and we'll fund them from the start. Bill, I wanted to uh, ask you about corporate VC in general. Um, it, it, to the extent that but, there but he's not a corporate VC. Right. <laughs> we don't think of ourselves as a corporate VC yeah, because I knew he was going to say that. We, uh, <laughs> it's true. We've done this show before. So we're so. a co-investor so, right. in companies. <laughs> we're invested. We're actually we're all invested in a number of companies together. But uh, we um, we don't we're not investing to further any of Google's strategic goals. We're actually a separate entity. Google's the LP in the fund. Um, so. Uh, obviously, it is Google Ventures, so there's a connection and an affiliation, and more than that as well. But uh, we're not uh, is not part of our charter or our screening mechanism to think about uh, does this further any of Google's products or services. Could you invest in a direct competitor? Sure, sure. Have you? Uh, I think these companies are so early stage. We've got uh, many, many dozens of, of investments at a, at a very early and seed stage. That uh, I'm sh I know that there are companies that do in a sense, compete with some of Google's products and services because you've got a 30,000 person, multi hundred billion dollar company that uh, thinks very um, out of the box about markets and whatnot. So it's only natural, but it's, it's my belief and it's generally Google's belief that that kind of competition fosters better uh, products and companies for the end user, which is really the goal. Okay. Can you speak more, even though you're, you're a, special, a special breed, can you speak more generally about the rise of corporate VC? I mean, is it, um, is it something that, that, that companies do decently? So there's a myth uh, that, uh, that corporate VC doesn't perform as well as traditional VC. And if you actually study the data, uh, and being from Google, we have uh, do a lot of data analysis, as you might imagine, that uh, the, the reality is that corporate VC actually performs as well or better across the curve 
uh, as a traditional VC. In, in any marketplace, you've got uh, some who aren't going to perform as well, and there's a bell curve distribution. Um, but there are examples of corporate VCs that, that invest very effectively financially or strategically, depending on what, uh, what their goal is. So um, I think uh, the last few years that that mind that sort of that there's been a shift kind of in uh, the thinking as to uh, it was very out of vogue and now it's sort of coming back into vogue. Uh, but it it uh, it's most effective when companies make a commitment and can do it for the long term. And Steamboat is a is a good example of a, that's Disney's venture fund and they've been doing it for years. And this is a long term business. It's long ball. Um, so if you sort of jump in when the market's hot and then jump out when it's not, uh, then you shouldn't expect you're going to have great returns. Let's, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I, I'm interested in following up on the incubator, uh, the incubator point. Uh, how has that changed uh, what professional investors do? I mean, uh, do you, it, does it mean that you have to act quicker? Uh, can you do one of these follow-ons and just look at anybody who's graduating from a given class? Uh, so let me do this. Let me make a brief comment on it. But since I'm not an incubator, I don't want to go into too much detail on it. But I think um, the right incubator, just like anything else, is essentially uh, a great way to find talent. So uh, I think uh, uh, we've invested both individually and as a seed fund in about roughly a dozen uh, incubator uh, source companies. And to us, it's not necessarily that it comes from X incubator or you know it's in this geography or that geography. Um, what we really care about is finding the iconic companies. In fact, one of the things that I wanted to address as well is n this notion that you know when people think of angel investors, all oh, these guys make a bunch of investments, put small amounts of money, you know, pull the gun like cowboys, and that's it. And I'm sure Ian wants to uh, counter that as well. But what we're seeing is that, especially when you have a lot more proliferation in the ecosystem, the only thing that matters for success is transcending these buckets. Like I always get asked these questions. Are you guys seed fund, early stage fund? What do you do? You know, do you only invest in Silicon Valley? And I think the one thing that we have done well is that we understand that the only thing that matters for success in this business is finding the iconic companies, the best founders. They could be in Silicon Valley. They could be in an outskirt of Helsinki like Rovio is. And um, I think the one thing that I've seen that was pretty interesting to watch is you know, four years ago, most of the deals were in Silicon Valley. And yet, out of the deals that we've done in the last 12 to 18 months, the ones that are most successful are getting into that scary velocity of growth. Three of them are actually outside of the US. And they're places like Finland, Canada, and Brazil. And we still have a lot of Silicon Valley companies, but success is not necessarily just limited to Silicon Valley. You cannot just say, we're going to look for these entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Um, the other thing that we've done is we are actually compensated as investors, not looking backwards, but looking forwards. So two years ago, we said, where are we going to find fast growth? And where are we going to find companies that can disrupt industries? And we, dis we saw that mobile, e-commerce, and enterprise, each of the three were going through transformational changes. And we started building a, a, a portfolio cluster in each segment, went from six mobile companies to 20 mobile companies, three e-commerce to 10. And what we said to founders that we talked with is, look, everybody can make contacts for you. Everybody can open the Rolodex. But one thing we're going to do is we're going to have such great clusters in the areas that we pick. If you work with us, it's not just our knowledge, but the great founders we work with and their knowledge. And we can help you with that. So we were very pragmatic with that. Um, also, kind of touching the earlier panel, you know, education was mentioned and health was mentioned. We were again, uh, 18, 24 months ago, realized that there was opportunity in few select areas in these areas that we could successfully get in, gotten involved. In fact, there has been a bunch of companies in those as well, and you know, uh, that we've done also with the other fellow panelists that both in health and education, there are great opportunities, and we've actually made great bets, and all of those companies are doing well. So uh, I think moving forward, one has to move even faster. As entrepreneurs, we need to be, as both entrepreneurs and investors, we need to be even more thoughtful and figure out where tomorrow's category leaders and disruptors and, and the great ideas will come from, and hopefully be a little bit ahead of what I call the herds of all the other investors. And that's what I think is going to generate tomorrow's great returns and great results. I think it, I, I would just mention, it's important to remember the way this business works, which is when we're looking at a company and we want to bring in a, another investor, we don't think, should we find a, a seed investor? I think, well, I, we like working with Iden, we like working with Howard, so we should call someone we know. It's a relationship business because uh, you're going to be on a board with the person and you want to work with people you know can help build companies and will be there for the company in, in the tough time. And then on the, on the, the incubator question, um, I think they're effective in certain segments. 
I mean, when we, we say incubator, we're usually thinking of technology companies or application companies, um, but there's a whole world of investments in uh, sort of the, the world of atoms rather than bits, like uh, um, uh, biotech companies and uh, material science and fundamental uh, um, uh, creativity that is outside of the world of just technology. And, and there aren't really great examples of a lot of incubators in those spaces, so incubator can be somewhat narrow when we talk about it as well. I, oh, yeah, I, I, would, I, I know you're going to ask a question, but I would just amend to that just two observations. One is that indeed the media loves, uh, there's always the, the pet story of the era or the time and, and the IT story. The, uh, you know, I, I met a guy at Virginia Tech when I went back there last month who's 21 years old, started a company nine months ago and just sold it for eight and a half million dollars and he's the only guy and he's 21 years old. That's a great story. It captures a lot of attention. The Mint.com story catches a lot of attention. In the media, the, the standard entrepreneur makes $100 million. But there's a lot of uh, this emergence of angels, the, the emergence of Kickstarter, other crowdsourcing ways of funding companies allow a broad range of different kinds of outcomes that are also quite lucrative. Uh, Autodesk is buying approximately one company a week. That's about 50 a year at an average purchase price of $10 million. I don't know what Google's buying, but there is a lot of acquisitions at purchase prices that don't fit the venture capital model and they don't fit the media model either because they don't make great copy. You never heard of the company. They're doing something somewhat obscure. They got bought for $16 million and there are only three people in it. It doesn't make the greatest story. You haven't been tracking it already. Um, but these are, this is real innovation. It's real jobs. Uh, if there was an angel investor in that deal, that's a real return. So there are lots of ways of angels to make money, for instance, that have nothing to do with the traditional venture capital model. And that kind of recycling of profits leads to that, more of that kind of investing and more of that kind of guidance for entrepreneurs. And so it used to be that, and it still is very much the case, that the out of the ballpark home run that Aiden has a couple of in his portfolio is the way really to make money. But there, is, there are alternate models too, which help promote angel investing in particular, where at exits that are much more modest, 10, 20, 30 million dollars. You can make 10x if you invest it at the right price, and the entrepreneurs can do very well too. Uh, speaking of the entrepreneurs doing very well, what has the emergence of uh, the the secondary markets uh, and the sort of I know we, you, everybody's on always on the same side, but there's some people that have a bigger bigger seat at that table. Um, how has how has that changed things? Have you have you all run into entrepreneurs that are uh, asking for too much too soon? Well, I, in our experience, just my two bits is uh, as angels, we often now for the first time in a long time, and we had a little bit of this in the first dot com boom, but much more recently, we uh, uh, exit opportunities at a venture round. So we had, uh, we've had two deals in the last couple of months that were funded in the upper double digits, like $70 million valuation. We invested around the single digits, and we had the opportunity to, to actually exit as part of that financing, at least part of our um, position so you can get your cost basis back. The entrepreneurs also get a little bit of money, so they basically are, the, are in the position of being able to take a few million dollars off the table and thus be able maybe more comfortably to double down on a, on a big exit. But then also, um, we're investors in shares posts and full disclosure, which is one of the secondary platforms, and that provides you know, currently access primarily to the top names that are the hottest, Facebook and Twitter and others. But increasingly, their ambition is to go down the food chain and be a primary source of fundraising capital for some of these companies. We'll see if it happens. Um, there's some reason to think it might not, but there's reason to think that will. Like right now, there's an effort in Congress, a bill sponsored by the senator from Massachusetts, um, to change the rules on what it means to, what the requirements are to be an accredited investor. Uh, with some limits, say like a $10,000 total limit investing in private companies that could very much change the way this crowdfunding model works for a lot of companies, for better or worse. Uh, I think one thing that I would like to add to that also is that, you know, again, referring back to the kind of change perspective, um, you know, we had amazing growth at Google and Google, when it went public, was one of those uh, star companies where literally I think it got profitability and revenues in record time. And yet, right after Google, uh, we saw a number of companies that recently went public 
uh, the jury is out in terms of how successful they're going to be, but in terms of their revenue growth uh, percentage and how fast they've been able to get to a level where they can at least consider an IPO has happened maybe at much less, even half the time that it took Google, and Google got there really, really fast. So one thing that we're seeing that because of that amazing growth, human beings are linear thinkers, not incremental exponential thinkers. So uh, now that people see that these growth can happen, and you're also seeing the emergence of these late stage funds with huge checkbooks and these funds are getting larger and larger, you're seeing a huge amount of money getting thrown at, at a few select companies. I think the one thing that we have to watch there um, is that some of the companies do deserve it because they really are uh, true category leaders and I believe that they have built enough competitive modes that you know, they're gonna benefit. Uh, from that and they warrant that valuation, but I think there is increasingly also kind of this uh, dichotomy of haves and have nots. So every company, every founder that sees another founder getting valued at 100 million and a billion, now they feel like that's the yardstick they have to measure against, but they also have to realize that those companies that are getting those valuations also have to build businesses that earn those valuations. So I think there is kind of a very competitive dynamic here. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, and I think it just makes for both excitement and challenge at the same time. So you, you asked the question about uh, founders selling shares, and um, I think it's a topic that often comes up, but the one view that doesn't usually get discussed is the view from the limited partner. And I discussed this with um, a guy I know who's at a very large funds of funds, and he was particularly pissed off. Um, at the idea of founders taking money off the table. And he gave me the example of he was, his fund is a limited partner in a successful early stage venture fund that put money in, one, and just to leave the names out, but in one of the hot companies that's in the billion dollar valuation range. But when he invest, when the VC invested, it was in the low double digit uh, million dollar valuation range. Great investment by that VC. VC is happy. Um, the company was happy they raised the money, and the LP was happy to be in the deal. Fast forward by two years, that LP is also an investor in one of these later stage funds, which flipped its process from being an investor to a secondary share purchaser. And that uh, VC firm the, put money into uh, a secondary share purchase, which made the founder of this company very rich, and also was buying shares from the earlier VC. And so from the LP's perspective, he, he was happy with his early stage investment, but his later stage investment now bought shares from the early stage VC, so his own money came back to him, less the carry that the early stage guy made, and all the rest of the money went out to the founder. So from the LP's perspective, the early stage guy made money, the founder made money, and the LP didn't. And from the LP's perspective, completely broken system. I want to contrast that. First of all, it's a free market. I mean, the late stage VCs don't have to do this. They don't have to buy the founder's shares. But the reaction of the LP was Correct, not to invest the in the LP, LP, it's very important here to highlight that the LPs also have to make their choices carefully. If they chose a late stage fund, they go into that knowing that the late stage fund is going to make deals like that, and maybe they have to make deals like that. And one has to realize that when DST was making the Facebook investment, everybody thought it was the crazy Russians and they're just stupid for paying valuations like that. If you look at their Facebook deal, the Zynga deal, the Groupon deal, each one of them is probably getting them at least a billion dollars or more. And nobody's laughing anymore, and now they have created this class of DST-like investment where they haven't really done anything new. They were just a little bit more bold, and they just said, you know what, we're just gonna give you capital, and we're not gonna request board seed, and they shook things up because I think things were different in late-stage deals. Now, all the late-stage funds are feeling the pressure, and they feel like they have to get these companies at whatever the cost. The founders are saying, I'm successful, I don't need money, and they're like, well, maybe we'll buy stock from you. And to put another perspective, uh, Facebook is a good example. I'm pretty sure that Mark Zuckerberg only early sold some of his shares, which probably made him think of more risk taking and build the company for the longer future. And I talked to a number of founders that said, you know what, if I could take a little bit money off the table, I can really go for the long run. I can really take huge risk. And I think it's fair. And it's, you know, for this to happen, it requires both sides. Nobody's forcing the investors to put the money, nobody's forcing the founders to sell their stock. If there is a joint agreement, then people have to deal with the cost. Well, I, th I mean, I would just jump in and say, when I was doing my startup, uh, I didn't have the option of taking money off the table. The idea of founder liquidity, like we understand if you have bills to pay or uh, you've got a mortgage, that's really different um, 
and you've invested in your company over time, that's really different than wanting to take millions of dollars basically out of the pocket of someone else and put it in your own because we're here to de-risk, to try and help de-risk the business's growth, but uh, there needs to be risk in entrepreneurship and, and doing a startup. And so open markets, I think, are, are a good thing. Uh, so I think it's fine that there are these secondary markets, but um, at the same time, I think the jury is still a little bit out on, on Groupon and, that, and, and maybe Zynga to some degree as well. It's sort of, uh, it's sort of um, hard to say whether, that, that kind of, whether that's investing so we don't, we're not making those kinds of uh, investments because we're trying to build companies. So if a founder comes in and says, well, I'm raising $10 million and I want to take a million and a half of it to put in the bank to secure my future, um, I understand that. But when I went through that process, it, you know, I was doubling down. I was not taking a salary. I wasn't trying to take money out of the financing. Um, so that does put, I think, investors in, a, in an uncomfortable position. And, and like you said, you can say no. So we usually say no to that. I, I, I have about 20 more questions, but I'd like to give other folks a, a chance here. So if, I guess we can start circulating the, the mics. And if you'll put your hands up if you have anything, I'd like to remind you to uh, introduce yourself again, if, if you would. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, Matt Bauer from Better World Telecom, and uh, we're um, we're not a startup, but we're some years into this and going into a growth round, and we're going to raise our funds through a, a direct public offering in California and file that in the next couple months. And actually, the, you know, the the bill that you talked about, there's there's three or four pieces of of legislation and rule changes going through. The SEC and Congress right now, and they seem to be on track to get passed really quickly. And uh, you know, the DPO option for us is seems really positive because um, it's a way to both combine institutional uh, or accredited, I say, I say accredited investors and um, and and non-accredited investors as well, and and sort of tap into the sort of democracy of the moment. And just wanted to get your thoughts on on that vehicle. Uh, which which has has been um, successfully done by hundreds of companies around the country, if not thousands, in different states. And any knowledge on that? And sort of that comment on the one to five million dollar uh, company revenue, which is where where we fit right now, which we seem to be kind of highly inefficient outside of the valley uh, in the market, and in different ways of attracting capital to companies like that that are ready to grow that that might not be sexy high tech ventures. Well, I'm no expert on the on the bills that are. I'm on the board of the Angel Capital Association, and we took a position in favor of the uh, changing of the rules that will accommodate greater crowdfunding. But there are a bunch of different rules, um, and uh, and I'm not. I'm no expert in all the different versions. But the the bottom line is maybe people don't appreciate that even today you can raise money from non-accredited investors. It just means that if you do so, you're taking on a bunch of liability and risk. And odds are, if you lose the investor's money they could very successfully um, sue you to get it back and, and, uh, and claw back their investment because they can l have a very low uh, hurdle to make a claim that, that they were um, snookered. Uh, and it's harder for accredited investors to do that. So this change in the rules would basically shift that um, and allow a company to raise money uh, from an unaccredited investor um, with, without taking on that burden of liability. Uh, and right now, there, are just, there, there seems to be a lot of consensus between the Democrats and Republicans around this issue. Um, and, uh, and it would have foster, presumably, more investment. You know, there are some attendant concerns, which hopefully the bill will attend to, particularly fraud. And um, the fact of the matter is most angels lose their money. The Band of Angels is a very successful organization in the aggregate. I mean, our IRR is, you know, in the mid double digits, 30, 40, 50 percent, depending on how you slice and dice it per year. It sounds fantastic. If you take out the top uh, nine deals, it's a negative IR out of 240 investments. So I think it's kind of a little bit worrisome for me um, and a bunch of us people that do this a lot with, to have the idea that people are going to be betting money or investing, <laughs> betting money they really can't afford to lose in startups across the country in some scalable way. But then again, the whole story of America has been one of a refinement of the law and 
mechanisms to do innovative finance that have actually liberated a lot of human capital. So it's worth, uh, you know, I think following through on these, and that's been the position of the Angel Capital Association. Anybody else want to jump in on any of the pending legislation? All right, who else? You know, gonna, but while you think about that, I'll ask, I'll ask another one. And so you mentioned Groupon and Zynga, um, uh, or, or a, number, a number of you did. Has there already been an impact in the, in, in the Valley uh, financing atmosphere from, from Groupon? And it, it, we, we do seem to be entering this new phase of, of very large valuations with very large volatility. Um, and it, 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 it seems like a lot might be hanging on what, how Groupon and Zynga uh, end up. Um, what sort of impact are you already seeing, if, if, if any? I think one thing um, to point there is that people are seeing um, the growth percentage. And I'm not saying that necessarily these two companies uh, are signs of success. It might just well be that in three to six months, it could look totally different. I mean, once you're public, you know, your, your numbers are public and it can go up, it can go down. Uh, but I think increasingly a much higher premium is being put on growth. So anything that is growing really fast is now getting uh, a, a huge amount of money, even to the point that even with the wildest multiples, you have to think very hard if that's a valuation that can justify that. And then you're also seeing a lot of money thrown uh, potentially at a bunch of different companies in the same space where I think with all this great stuff that's happening, the challenge for a lot of these companies is fragmentation. Anybody who can join a company as a great employee is starting their own company. So these companies has, have to grow, have to attract talent. And then you're seeing the same kind of approach of like Groupon or Zynga type of like, hey, this company is growing really fast. We're going to throw money at it. And then there are three, four in, into an industry segment. And it's clear that there's only going to be one winner. So I, I'm sure that there's going to be great successes. There's probably also going to be some, some adjustments and some resets as well. So. Uh, let's, let's, let's pick on uh, Groupon a little bit more. Do you, you, you really think there's only going to be one winner in the, in the daily deal space? Could, could, could there be more? Do I, they have any unfair I, I would, advantage? It, it's not difficult to imagine a world where in six months Groupon doesn't exist. It's also not difficult to imagine a world where in six months they're twice as big. As an investor, that's kind of scary. It's, it's more difficult to imagine a world where, say, Apple has gone away. Um, and so I don't know, I'm not an investor, we're not investors, um, I don't know enough about the business to really say for sure, but there's a point where the price for the risk that you're taking exceeds you know, sort of the, the threshold that, that I would be comfortable with. I don't know if it is in this case because uh, it hasn't priced, but um, whenever, to get back to the other question, individual, I get a little bit nervous when individuals start concentrating rather than diversifying their portfolios. as a you know, a former public market investor in a previous life, um, diversification is important. And so uh, um, you can take bigger risks. And I'm not sure if individuals who, and I know accredited investors that don't understand that you could lose all of your money. And most people, well, you gave a great example. Most people do in angel investing uh, lose a lot of money and uh, do it as a hobby or they enjoy meeting entrepreneurs and that's fine. But um, I don't know that, uh, that the risks are totally understood. So when that behavior gets ahead of the curve of understanding, uh, then you enter into kind of a, a scary zone. And, and everyone loves to play the what's going to happen with this IPO game, but that's a little bit of a game because the value of Groupon should be based on the discounted value of its future cash flows. And so to the degree that you can successfully predict that, great. To the degree that you're just guessing that daily deals are going to be a big thing in six months, that's not really investing. I think one, one little comment to add there is one thing that we have to be careful, I think the interesting element of, of, of the whole Groupon discussion, factoring in Google and Apple, is that uh, Apple is a really great example. They've been successful in an area, but Steve Jobs was not afraid to take that currency of success, cannibalize his own business, iPods, and come up with a great product, iPhone, and make his company more successful. So I think the one thing that we're, we're losing perspective of is it's only one slice in time where we're seeing, okay, this company has gone public, 
and you know, it has done one thing really well, and what's gonna happen, and we're only focusing on that one thing looking backward. <coughs> However, I think what's really important here is, once you have that currency of success, what you do with it is really important. I don't think you can stagnate and just take the same thing and say this formula is gonna work, and we're seeing already uh, Zynga you know, has been really successful, but now their growth curve is flattening. So it, it is very important that when you're growing that fast, you take that currency of success, you have to constantly reinvest it and come up with different things, that, you know, sometimes cannibalize. I mean, Google's business has changed drastically a lot too. I mean, when I was at Google and I was one of the early employees, if you told me Google is gonna get into phone operating system, I would say, wow, you're crazy. Like, I don't really see how that's gonna happen. Like, Google is gonna be an email provider. You know, it was not really foreseeable back then. And yet Google has done all these things because they really understand that once you have that currency of success, you have to keep innovating and keep getting into areas that are really critical to really make that success uh, more, more long term as, uh, yeah, as so, Bill has alluded to. So let me to add to that. We have an advantage as, as investors in that uh, if we think mobile security is going to be a really important industry to invest in, we can make 10 or 20 investments at a, at a sort of uh, what I would think of as a more reasonable price. Uh, and, and sort of invest in that trend. Now, not every venture investor invests that way, uh, but as a, as a non-accredited individual looking at, say, well, name a company, Groupon, and you're sort of betting that one, that that is gonna be an industry, and two, that this is the company that's going to dominate it, um, that there's a lot more risk inherent in that than being able to seed invest in you know, 10 companies in related spaces, and, and like you said earlier, one may pay off that may pay for the rest that you know, rest that you've done, and you might find that that Google or Facebook that uh, that takes it to a whole different level. All right. Any any uh, anybody else from from the floor here? Hard to see. No. All right. They're stunned with our insights. I think. So, just talking about the lower valuation, or I guess the lower prices that the companies are exiting at. Are you seeing, um, are the, is this process where a company gets taken out at an early stage for a low, relatively low price, 10 to 20 to $30 million, is that something where um, it, it's just a, across the board, the company knows what they want and they go out and get it and they're, Early stage investors, if they're there, are happy, or are, is is there is there increasingly um, attention being given by the advisory community, <clears throat> where these companies are being shopped because of the quality of the team, something well, like if that. You're a, if, I mean, in my experience, and Google is a big acquirer of companies. Um, if you're 25 years old and you've got college loans and uh, Google or Facebook or whomever wants to buy your company and put $10 million in your pocket and then you get to join this company and the future looks unbounded in some way. So to some entrepreneurs, I mean, it's their call. It's not, our, we're just investors in the company, so we have a voice, but um, the entrepreneur generally makes that call and, and who, would, who would I be to, to sort of reign on that dream? But you try and figure that out ahead of time, but sometimes an uh, entrepreneur might say that you know, I'm in it for the long term, but then the idea of I can secure my family's future for the rest of our lives, that, that's really a hard thing to try and talk someone out of. On the flip side, you've got someone like Mark Zuckerberg who had lots of offers early on and said, no, I'm gonna build this into a giant company. And Larry and Sergey were the same way. It's just, it's hard to read those motivations ahead of time, but like Howard said, we try and talk to entrepreneurs about it so you can understand and, and not get into that, you know, potential conflict situation later where you see no, this could be 10x, but your appetite for risk is different than the entrepreneurs. So, I, I mean, it's, a, it's really, you see the full range of things. So yeah, if, if we I see a company and they, you know, we're interested in investing, if we think they might sell early, we just won't invest because it's not a good use of our time. We might be missing, our time is spent on that company instead of some other company that may go long. But we invest in some companies and we believe they're gonna go long and they believe they're gonna go long and then two years later somebody offers, Google offers to buy them for 20, 30 million dollars or whatever. And once the, you know, the offer is out, 
in many cases, the entrepreneurs, they're not Zuckerberg, and they say, oh, that's a lot of money, and if I say no, it might go to nothing, and this is harder than we thought, and we thought we would have been further along, and in many cases, they take the offers, and we don't blame them for it. We just say, hey, you know, that's your, it's your company. It's your decision. If we force you or coerce you into not taking the offer and things don't work out later, then we're the bad guys in that case. So we kind of let the entrepreneurs make their decision, but we try and filter that by not investing in guys that we think will. You know, we do other things like we say, you know, oh, the entrepreneurs say, well, we think we could sell the company now for this amount of money. And we say, well, don't get an offer because if you get one, it sort of drives its own process moving forward. So before you get that offer, really decide if you want that offer, because once you get it, you probably will sell the company. I, I, I would think that we're, seeing, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. If, you know, with the exceptions of, of your Groupons and your Zingas, there's still a pretty long, long uh, takeoff uh, ramp towards IPOs in the past seven years in, in many cases. And if, if you're a smart, a smart company looking to get IP and good people, it's, it's, it's time to get serious about shopping and, and looking for those companies to to make them an offer that maybe they, in other days, they could have refused, but now they'll find hard to. It. So that, that's got to be a challenge for you guys. I think the point to be made here is I think that's where you see the difference between fund sizes. So one of the reasons why we elected to have a very conservative and small fund size is we wanted to be aligned with the founders. And our philosophy is that the founder is right. And I think this is an area where- So you're saying a large fund size isn't al aligned with I'm, the founders? I'm just saying that we feel better aligned with the founders given our fund size. But the, the other point that I want to make is I think that's an area where you can definitely see, uh, you can definitely differentiate investors because the one thing we do, we do for the founders is we already had over 20 exits and we had a lot of investments. Our job is not to tell the founder what to do, but to give him the data points and the perspective, saying that we did see founders that have sold for those kind of amounts, and next year and the year after, they kept doubling and said, you know what, we could have probably waited a year or two. We have seen uh, times where founders have sold the company, it was the perfect time. We have seen all kinds of different things. So I don't think our job is to really tell the entrepreneur what to do, but to give them enough perspective so that they can make the right decision for themselves. And also, hindsight is always perfect. It's 2020. So you just have to give them enough stuff where they feel, you know what, I feel better making the decision now, now that I had like a few examples that are comparables, and we make them talk to founders that have been in those shoes before. And I think that's the difference between just mere capital and people that have operational expertise as well as a lot of expertise of having to make these tough decisions and being able to be on the founder's side and really well, help like, them with it's like anything it's like anything in life. I mean it's expectations versus reality. A twenty million dollar exit for August, I don't know if I can put words in your mouth, isn't going to be meaningful. I mean that's not the job that they set out to do, whereas a twenty million dollar exit or a $30 million exit for Iden could, so it's like, it's like investing is like dating. It's like you got to make sure that if, if a 20 or $30 million exit to the degree you can is really going to be meaningful for you, Mr. Entre or Ms. Entrepreneur, and uh, let me know that now because I might not be the right person for you and I'll connect you to Iden. We, we, we do have another question from over here. Yeah, um, one question, uh, George Foster from Stanford. On the global dimension, what what are the interesting things that you're seeing outside the U.S. in terms of the angels and the uh, different types of venture capital? So let me give you a quick anecdotal answer. Last night, 10.30 p.m., uh, I get an email to one of my companies. Some entrepreneur in St. Petersburg wants to know, like, hey, there are a lot of great founders here. This is the third largest city in Europe. Uh, great math talent. Where do we get incubators? Where do we get help? It so happens that I know through Rovio, which we're investors in Finland, there is a, a group called Startup Sauna. It's this really funny name, but it is actually a legitimate group. And it's an incubator, and it helps startups, and they have annual events. They bring investors, and literally within two hours, I made the connection for that founder. And you know, yesterday at LinkedIn, I must have gotten 10 requests, and at least six of them were international. And not just a single country, too, all over the place. So I'm just seeing a huge internationalization. I think everybody's seeing what entrepreneurship can do for them. There is greater interest. And in terms of trends, so that's just one anecdotal evidence. We're seeing that things like e-commerce is pretty universal. Unlike search and media, it doesn't get censored. And a lot of the countries are lagging slightly behind advanced Western economies. So we definitely see that formula really work. So if diapers.com has been a huge success in US, we are investors in the equivalent of diapers.com in Brazil, 
and they're actually having a better growth curve and better success in Brazil than diapers.com had in early in the US. So definitely that formula works, and there are several other elements too, and that's the reason like we found an amazing company in outskirts of Ottawa in Canada. Like how many seed investors in Angel from Silicon Valley bother to fly all, all the way there, meet the founders, meet the company, make a call, oh yes, this is a great team, we're gonna back them, we do it because we're like that extra 5-10% effort is basically the difference between us being part of that iconic company and not. And that's what it's gonna take to be, uh, I think, more and more in the future in terms of to be on top of these companies. All right, uh, time, time for another here. Uh, Bob Watkins from San Diego. Just a, a general question, that is, uh, what do you think the impact has been or the disruption has been uh, in the traditional venture capital world with the advent of the super angel and uh, secondary markets and so forth? Has it had any impact? As I commented earlier, I think that there's entrepreneurs, there's the right fit for super angels and there's the right fit for VCs and they just have to find each other in the night and make sure that it's a good fit. Um, Maybe there weren't as many choices in the past, um, and there's more choices now, which is only better for everyone, because then it's a better fit for the entrepreneurs. They're getting what they want. It's a better fit for the investors, because it's exactly what they're looking for. So from that perspective, I think it's great. I think on um, secondary market, I made a comment from the LP's perspective before, where there are as many unhappy LP's, everybody's making money but them. My personal opinion is the market is what the market is, and if you, want to get shares in a company and they're not for sale from the company, but they are in the secondary market, that's your choice if you want to buy, be a buyer or be a seller. The only area I have an issue is sometimes you end up with conflicts of interest where an entrepreneur at this is raising money and selling secondary shares at the same time. So their decision process and how to structure the deal and what price to be and who to take for the investment and what allocations to do end up being driven more by personal um, greed in the process, and it's not in the best interest in the, for the company. So when entrepreneurs ask me that specific question, I always say I have no problem with you selling shares, but if you are also raising money, first you raise money, and when that's done, then you sell shares. But don't mix the two up, because then you're not being fiduciary responsible to all of your shareholders. Hey, open markets, open source, open systems, these are all good things. So um, you know, from my perspective, uh, as someone, raising money in 1997 was a lot more difficult, at least for me. Um, there, there wasn't the same category of angels and super angels and uh, different uh, places you go to get capital. Uh, of course, there are excesses on both sides. People raise too much money or, or not enough, but frankly, um, it's made my job easier be, in a sense because there's a whole category of individuals that have a source of deal flow and relationships uh, with entrepreneurs that are different than ours as an institutional uh, investor might be. And uh, when we talk about angels versus VCs, it doesn't actually work that way in the business. You know, we're all trying to look at the same companies and trying to work with individuals uh, to fund the ones that we think are, have, have a lot of potential. So um, having people like Aiden and Ron Conway and others that um, that do a, investing in a different way, really uh, that kind of open marketplace is healthy for entrepreneurs. It's been great for us in terms of uh, uh, deal flow and our ability to see things that we might not have seen. And, and frankly, they add a lot of value to companies and, that are trying to grow uh, in, a, in categories that we're, that we're not in or trying to replicate. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, in, in, on our side, I think it's become more and more important to go to the entrepreneurs and say, look, this is not just about money, but you need a winning syndicate. And we do value uh, a differentiation that you know, Google Ventures might bring to the table. I think all the things that you're pointing out, like I was saying earlier, you know, you know, early on, we, I think, uh, I benefited from being one of the first people to leave Google uh, as an angel, and then like this whole super angel phenomenon, and I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and had made just the right amount of investment, whatever, and you know, um, it, it's just the evolution of the ecosystem. I think it's really healthy. I think hopefully it's a net net win for all the entrepreneurs and founders. I mean, it's just more competition. It means that the investors uh, have to do a better job. The investors have to. Uh, try harder to get into the best companies and involve and prove their value proposition. So 
I think it's, it, it just makes more for a more fun and challenging environment and hopefully you know, uh, we, can, we can do a good job in just that to, environment. Just to put it in real terms, in 1997, I literally sat down and wrote a letter to Kleiner and Sequoia and, uh, and hoping that I would get a letter back or a phone call. Now, if you're raising money today, there are people like Aiden or, uh, that, that are easy to reach that actually want to have a lot of meetings with a lot of entrepreneurs and see a lot of, uh, a lot of things. And I think that is healthy for, uh, for the ecosystem. It makes it um, much more competitive, and competition's a, a good thing. It gets entrepreneurs better terms. It hopefully gets us uh, uh, healthier deals, too. Okay, I think that's a uh, pretty good note to end on. Uh, and uh, thanks. Uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, the panel. Uh, it's, uh, very informative. Thanks very much.